I, I think you're looking good. Well, you always look good, but, um, you know. <laughs> did, did you see how I did that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, she worked it in there quick. I should move. Well, I, on this study, I originally thought, you know, two weeks, maybe three. I'm beginning to think three weeks, maybe, maybe four. four. <laughs> But I, you know, I appreciate the discussion. I would rather have that than soar through it. But uh, we're we're looking at overcoming, and I decided to look at the, you know, the seven churches in so-called Asia. Asia is the broader territory, but and yeah, because not all of them was in the territory of Lydia. Uh, it's kind of funny the the, the one that didn't have anything bad to say about it was outside of that spot but but it's 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 still good to talk about these and I'll get to the point sooner or later <laughs> but um, and you guys already know what the point is probably anyway but we made it to Pergamon and I thought well yeah let's go ahead and not go with that one so I'll just go ahead and read that. So I haven't even been reading the parts, but so it goes something like this. And this is again the complete Jewish Bible translation by Dr. David Stern. Uh, to the Messianic community, to the church in Pergamum, write Here is the message from the one who has the sharp double edged sword. I know where you are living, there where the adversary's throne is, yet you are holding on to my name. You did not deny trusting me even at a time when my faithful witness Antipas was put to death in your town, there where the adversary lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have some people holding who hold to the teaching of Bilam, who taught Malak to set a trap for the people of Israel so that they would eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and commit sexual sin. Likewise, you too have people who Hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, therefore turn from these sins. Otherwise, I will come to you very soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Against them with the sword of my mouth. Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the Messianic communities. Mm -hmm. To him winning the victory, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone on which is written a, na a new name that nobody knows except the one receiving it. So if there's any thoughts before I give my notes, that's okay. I I enjoy hearing from you guys. We sang about this in worship the other day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's called very close and very personal relationship. Yeah. Well, my little paragraph. I, I was just writing little paragraphs about this until, I don't know, I think it was maybe the Sardis, I think I wrote a bunch maybe for Philadelphia. But anyway, all I wrote on this was Pergamum was a city, was a city of many pagan deities, not the least being Telephus, son of Hercules. Today it is in modern Turkey. I don't even know why I should say that everybody knows this. <laughs> it's, it's, turkey. <laughs> yeah, it's, in turkey. it's deities seem to be more uh, animalistic. This is likely why some therein held to the teaching of Balaam, or Balaam, who taught Balak just how to how to cause Israel to destroy themselves via all-out sexual perversion. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Hidden manna is a reference to a pot of manna preserved within the Ark of the Covenant. You can see that in Exodus chapter 16 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse or 9 verse 4, along with a white stone. A white stone was customarily as an emission ticket to public festivities. Having that white stone with a name given to you exclusively by the Messiah is a quantum leap of pure identification with the King of Kings mm -hmm. attained by those who overcome. You know, that's, you know, it'd be like me calling her something that 
no one else knows that color or vice versa, you know, you just, that's called close, close relationship. Uh, and if you have any thoughts, I'm okay with that too. I, I just had a tech crisis. So I'm sitting here reading your paragraph <laughs> so that I'll know where you are. Okay. <laughs> Switching me. phones. It's horrible. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> so no other thoughts? Okay. And we already talked about Nicolaitans. Um, you know, yeah, they're, they've, they've got some issues that can be described, but... We never do translate the word Nicolaitan, Nico ruler, one ruler over the laity, but nonetheless, um, that's the main problem. Mm -hmm. Well, Thyatira. Thyatira, Thyatira, also part of modern Turkey, was also likely a Lydian name. An older name for this town is Pilopia. Thyatira uh, is noted in history for its trade or business guilds. A following of Yeshua, a following of Jesus with a livelihood dependent on his or her membership within such a guild could face problems that could violate a good conscience, if not throw one into idolatry. Quote, it says, that Isabel or Jezebel, we say Jezebel, it's Isabel. That Isabel woman was likely someone whose way of life mimicked Isabel, who heavily supported idolatry and came dangerously, dangerously close to wiping out any true worship of the one true God. Her children, quote unquote, are folks with no care or ambivalence. Rather, they are fully trained by such a way of existence with a coming result that is worse than a sickbed. Those who do not hold to deep teachings of our common enemy, Yeshua only encourages them to, quote, hold fast to what, to what you have until I come, end of quote. I didn't read it. To those who overcome, Yeshua more or less quotes from Psalm Chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, which speaks of being given duties, quote, just as I have received authority from my Father. To those who overcome, he will also give the morning star, likely the Messiah himself, if you're looking on into Revelation chapter 22, 16, refers to the Messiah as a morning star. But... Uh, any thoughts concerning this? I probably should have read the matter, the whole thing. I want to backtrack because my um, mm -hmm. my tech crisis <clears throat> didn't allow me to insert right there at mm -hmm. the end of what you wrote mm -hmm. on Pergamon. What? Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice quantum leap of pure identification. Interesting. Okay. Um, what we're trying to do after each one is see how that applies to today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and things we're going through today. Right. That's and why I said, I don't, you're welcome to speak. Yeah, no, I wasn't <laughs> ready. Sorry. No. Um, <laughs> I'm ready now. I'm ready now. Yes. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're going to, we need to go back to Pergamon. Okay. Okay. Because well, that is like really something going on right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'll just, I'm, I have, I have this lovely little graph <laughs> that, uh, has all the churches and like little segments of, yeah. of what they did. Unless I'm not mistaken, this goes all the way back to when we studied Revelation over there. No. How do you mean? Oh, this thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, at one point, it took us three years to go through Revelation. We killed it. Um, and this particular graph came from that particular study. And um, I'd like to take credit for it, but a really smart man brought it to um, study. And I decided I wanted it. So, Pergamum, historical age. 314 A.D. to 590 
AD. Interesting. Okay, it's called Satan's Church, the inner city church. The description of Jesus in it is one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Thank you, Jesus, that he's not a wuss. Okay, sorry, that was a rant there. Um, the commendation to the church was, I know your works and where you dwell. You hold fast my name. And did not deny my faith. So back here when it says Satan's church, I don't want you to think that it was, you know, like a satanic church. It was a church placed in direct proximity to the enemy. And were constantly oppressed by that enemy. And, uh, you know, it says here that I know your works and where you dwell, you hold fast my name. You did not deny my faith. One of the things that um, I think we have to be really careful about right now is that we hold fast to Jesus' name and we don't deny our faith. Because right now you have a society that wants us to denounce our faith, our trust. That's just another word for trust. And so for those of us who trust Jesus, trust God, trust the Holy Spirit over every other thing in our life, um, you are, we are now beginning to be condemned for that in America, where it used to not be that way. You know, we held more sway. Jesus held more sway than the enemy did in America. That is flipping radically fast. Yeah. And so, um, you know, my encouragement would be, man, think about things for one. Mm -hmm. Analyze what you're being told, what you're being asked to do. Consider, what would Jesus do? I mean, <laughs> consider truly what God would ask you to do in each of those particular situations and then do it do not sacrifice your integrity mm -hmm. to make your life easier so don't sacrifice your um strength so that you can look like a victim because mm -hmm. that's really popular right now you know, we worship that victimhood. We need to stop. The whole book of Revelation is you will overcome by the blood, the name of Jesus, your witness. I know I'm not quoting it exactly. That's okay. I'm getting those pieces in there, even if they're... <laughs> so... Um, We desperately need Jesus to be our fortress that we run into when the enemy is coming after us. So, uh, reproof given to the church. Some who hold to the teaching of Bilaam, eating things, sacrifice to idols, fornication, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, one ruler over many. You always talk about that. I'm sure you had that in there. Um, fornication is the nice little churchy word for sexual deviancy. Lack of self-control. Mm -hmm. Basic self-control. If you can't manage that, how on earth are you going to win any battles for God? Say that. I don't know what the teaching of the law means. What well, does that mean? Yeah. I mean you, it, is that what you said? Held to, who yeah. taught Balak just how to cause Israel to... Oh, yeah. That's the beginning of sexual perversion. Yeah, he taught Balak just how to... Because Israel couldn't be destroyed. It says it there in the passage. So he, he was not able to curse them because they're blessed. <laughs> Can't curse what's blessed. Wow. So, oh, well... Block, Mr. Block, here's how you get them to destroy themselves. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. And so through is that not what's happening to America? Right. Yes. Exactly. So it's and well, how we identify ourselves. Yeah. And so not how God identifies. So He taught us. them to go to Baal Peor, which means the, the God of complete burying of yourself, you know, physically, basically any 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 sexual activity goes. Was the God of Peor. And so we and we talked about that a few weeks ago, and and kind of seeing where the country's going, and so yeah. So well, yeah, this so, though, but then it sorry. says hold fast to his name, and I was going to yeah. read. But you go ahead. What you you have something to read right there? Well, yeah. Go for um, it. You guys know this because I've said before. I'm, I imagine you know, but a name in the Bible, sure, you know. Um, James Patrick or something like that, but but a name is more than that too. A name is character, such as the infamous Exodus 34, beginning at verse six. Adonai passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed Yodevave, Yodevave. You know the Lord, the Lord um, is God, merciful and compassionate, slow to anger. This is his name. He said, "Okay, here's my name." Merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace and truth, hasid vehement, showing grace to thousand generations, forgiving offenses, crimes, and sins, and yet not exonerating the guilty, but causing the negative effects of the parents' offenses to be experienced by their children and grandchildren, even, even by the third and fourth generations. There's a name. <laughs> Quite in, a other, name. in other words, a name, character. So if he gives you a name that only you know and he knows, He's given you character that's directly from him, and he knows that character, and you know that character. Somebody else may know a lot of that character, but not like he does. And so, okay. Well, and that's perfect, Um, because if you if you know how God has defined you, if you know what he's asked you to do with your life, if you know what level of um, standards that you have to live up to. Okay, if you know those things, and if you're studying the word, you're going to know those things. Okay, and if you're listening to God specifically, uniquely, the name that he's given each person, he's called me, he's asked me to do something radically different than what he's asked JP to do. And it's because both those bases need covered. Mm -hmm. If we compromise those standards, those um, purposes, if we go, uh, yeah, and I'm preaching to myself here. If we think I'm not capable, like Moses, Mm -hmm. I'm not capable. Uh, if we say, I don't have the resources or I don't have the uh, time allotment <laughs> required, um, we're compromising God's intent, which is the best intent. You know, that's that's the way we get to be the best we can possibly be mm. is to hear that from him. Yes. But if we compromise that. Repent, or else I am coming to you quickly and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Somebody yesterday brought up the subject of God with teeth. You were saying that I don't, I don't preach you God with teeth. And I don't believe that to be true. I believe that of of all the things we kind of get, you know, Round upon heavily is that God has teeth. God is a God of mercy. He is a God of justice. And that justice is not a, you know, a big hammer ready to thump you on the head. His justice is I love that person. This thing is attacking my daughter. You better look out. Because I have, what is, 
one who has the sharp two-edged sword. He can speak to people sharply. He can make war against them with the sword of his mouth. Which is the word. Which mm -hmm. is the word and which is what created the heavens and the earth. His word is what created humanity in the first place. Mm -hmm. Don't underestimate. Well, I, I commonly say that, yeah, okay, he came first time as the suffering servant, Ben Yosef, Ben Joseph, son of, you know, the, the guy that suffered before he made it to the top. But he's coming back as the son of David, the, what Exodus 15 calls the man of war. Mm -hmm. And you can read Revelation. I mean, you say, okay, you didn't accept the mercy. You didn't like the grace. Here's what's left over. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so, um, you know, and, and you can read it. It's Well, he leads Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And he's riding on his horse. And he's already called in all the birds of prey. Because they're going to have a feast and a half. Mm -hmm. And the blood is supposed to be up to the bridle, bridle the of the horses. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all he does Most is Most people speak. miss that. So, yeah, you're good. All he does is speak. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, that's got to have something going on besides just yeah, so wishy-washy stuff. I mean, yeah, that's so just, I've often said, hey, you know, if, if you don't like the, the mercy and grace that he came with the first time, might want to get ready for what's left over because that's called straight, pure justice. And we think we know what justice is. Um, justice to a world that's gone absolutely berserk. Mm, yeah, that's well, that's the that's the two edged sword component too. Is it, it cuts both ways? Mm -hmm. You know, if if we believe that God is the same today and will be the same, you know, then we also have to believe that He was the same in the Old Testament too, and He was just as you know ruthlessly you know against sin then when it was his own people that, yeah. you know, were screwing up. Yeah, and look so. at the very first time the word church is mentioned yeah. in, in Scripture. Acts 5, I think it is. Hananiah and Shapira or Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, Peter utters some words and bang, they drop. Mm -hmm. Dead, right there. Yeah. Why? Because they lied to the Holy Spirit. You don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... Folks will say, well, that was a mean, bad God in the Old Testament. We have a nice guy in the New Testament. Yeah, uh, the same same, same guy. The guy that says, I do not change. And I treat, uh, I, I don't, maybe I'm weird, but that kind of justice makes me feel loved. He's going to defend me. Mm -hmm. He's going to make everything right again for me. Mm -hmm. He's not going to leave me at the hands of an enemy to do with what he wills. God will defend me and make sure that I end up in the right place. So, but, and the nice thing here's, okay, here's the promise to the overcomers. So these are people that do not compromise. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name. And I just read your last sentence, um, obviously far after you originally read it, but a name given to you exclusively <laughs> by the Messiah <clears throat> is a quantum leap of pure identification with the King of Kings. I don't care to be identified with or by anybody else. Mm -hmm especially myself, because I will not identify myself correctly. So I'm very thankful yeah. that God is going to choose my identity, choose to describe, and I'm going to say, choose to describe my identity. He's not going to say, oh, you're an introvert and you have bad breath. <laughs> he's not going to, he's not going to, 
all of a sudden create something, not me. Mm -hmm. He's going to describe me the way he actually sees me yeah. in purity in strength and through the name and the blood of Jesus. That's right. Honest. Honest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was teaching oh. our clients that this morning. We, we read a poem this morning. Um, it kind of says that to not think of yourself higher. I think of Romans every time, but it <laughs> said to not think of yourself as greater or less than others, mm. you know, because mm. either one of those is narcissistic and yeah. egotistical. And so, exactly. But we can't. I. I wanted to add to that, you know, we can't do that without God. We can't. Because mm -hmm. it's just a competition. Yep. Very know? true. I, a couple of yep. Wednesday nights ago, I looked at our friend Adrian, who has considered moving over here, that I, I told him, I said, boy, if there's anything that I long for people to be right now, it's just simply honest. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just, you know, just... If, if even if you want to avoid me, at least you can tell me that. <laughs> like tell me, and it's a good. It can be good, good and bad. Like you never feel safer unless you're with people that can tell you something good mm -hmm. about you and kind of flawed. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's that's honest. I'm I'm getting an accurate picture of myself, but mm -hmm. through the lens of we bias. We don't always have right. that accurate picture of mm -hmm. ourselves right. because we go by what we were told when we were little. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how many kids have you had that didn't think they were, were good mm -hmm. enough or worth anything? That was so hard, especially mm -hmm. if their parents were going through a breakup or something. Mm -hmm. and kids felt like they were part of what well, did it. Mm -hmm. You know, I did it. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And, it, yeah. It's rough one, and I guess, you know, I mean, they, some may just grow up that way, you know, mm -hmm. thinking, well, I, I probably won't have a good marriage because I saw my mom and daddy do this, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, want kids, I don't want kids because I guess I was part of those. Mm -hmm. And I have heard mothers say, well, if I hadn't had my children, mm -hmm. I could have done so and so. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there thinking, I can't see that because I wanted children. I wanted and children. I didn't have children. Yeah, me either. Well, mm -hmm. I wasn't supposed to. And <laughs> everything was held back until I had. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because I went through. I went through at that time. Some of the medical things that they did were really kind of <laughs> archaic. And, <laughs> Then they tell you, oh, well, you, we did this, 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 and you will not have any children. So when you adopt, then you're thrilled to death, and whoops. <laughs> <laughs> then comes here, comes, comes back. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lord can do some interesting stuff. But, uh, you know, God will have those girls that he wanted me to have. <clears throat> not that I'm perfect, but both mm -hmm. girls needed me and I needed mm -hmm. them. And then Matt was a little icing on the cake, you know. I mean, it was just. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can share. Oh, Lord. Just kind of along the line that both of you saying. Because um, I know, you know, it, okay, well, one of the songs that I've been listening to lately because it's sung by a Scottish fella and, and it was actually written in America in the 1920s. But. Um, says i wonder as i wonder out under the sky why jesus my savior would come for to die for somebody like me and you know how many songs tons of songs written along that line well if i may answer that question and i understand you know i i, I get it because we compare ourselves to so and so and so and so and so and so but let's for a little bit compare ourselves to or talk about what what God's intention is, created us in his image as his likeness. He's heard me say this. In his image as his likeness, as in representation, breathed in us, the word there, neshama, which Job uses as the intellect, breathed his intellect in us, into us. That's why we're not like the animals. Animals don't go out and create computers and watches and the like. Mm -hmm. We do because we're 
created in his image. Mm-hmm. He chases Israel as his bride, calls her over and over again his bride. Peculiar people. You look up the word peculiar there, segula, what you call your wife. Mm-hmm. And and he says that in first in, in Exodus, you know, you are my special treasure, segula, wife. And in, a, in that sense, you might say God doesn't need anything. But then again, he needs you like a husband needs his wife. So why did he come to die? Because we're not in the Garden of Eden anymore. It's very simple. This marvelous creation that he created to have that kind of marital relationship with ran off. Mm-hmm. Did not show up for the first Sabbath and ate from the wrong tree. Like he said not to. This is going to be your death. And ta-da! <laughs> and so, hey, you know, you, you're on that path. You've gone further and further and further down that path. I need to come and die for you because you're dying and you need somebody completely and utterly sinless to die for you. Mm. Well, that's why, because it's his wife. Human beings were meant to be that. Yeah. So if you ever wonder, as you're wondering, out under the sky, just who am I? Remind yourself of just who you really are in his eyes. And that's why he can give you a name that nobody knows except you and him, because you have that kind of marital relationship. Hey, there. Mm -hmm. Nice job. Okay. Did you finish reading Thyatira? Because we didn't get that one. Well, I read the notes. I didn't. I thought, you know, I kept. Yeah, I. um, I kind of kicked myself for not reading the passage, actually, from okay. the Bible. So yeah. if you don't mind, I'll go ahead. And, really yeah. Again, Stern's translation. The To the angel of the Messianic community at Thyatira, right. Here is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like burnished brass. I know what you're doing, your love, trust, service, perseverance. And I know that you are doing more now than before. But I have this against you. You continue to tolerate that Isabel woman. Uh, and this Jezebel lived a long time ago, but this is um, someone who mimics her, obviously. The one who claims to be a prophet, but is teaching and deceiving my servants to commit sexual sin and eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. And this is not about food sacrifice, actual food that you eat. It's talking about sexual sin. I gave her time to turn from her sin, but she doesn't want to repent, doesn't want to repent of her immorality. So I'm throwing her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I'm throwing into great trouble unless they turn from the sins connected with what she does, and I will strike her children dead. Then all the Messianic communities will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and that I will give to each of you what your deeds deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, to those who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some people call the quote-unquote deep things of the adversary, I say this. I am not loading you with, uh, with another burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To him who wins the victory, to him who overcomes and does what I want until the goal is reached. And then he pretty much quotes Psalm 2. I will give him authority over the nations. He will rule over them, rule them with the staff of iron and dash them to pieces with like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the Messianic communities. So, and if you have thoughts on that passage or if you remember a bit of note I gave a few minutes ago. That's okay. I don't mind. In fact, I like it. I just keep hearing phrases to both churches like, ah, you're doing really good, but I have one complaint. You continue, you continue to tolerate. Mm-hmm. You continue to permit. <coughs> you continue mm-hmm. to tolerate. You continue to permit. I'm kind of asking the Lord what that means. 
for me because I feel like he highlighted that for me personally. And I don't know if that's because I just have like open gates to a lot of things like to hear from other people or, you know, like, I don't know. I think the Lord's telling me personally to have that filter mm-hmm. and don't tolerate, like don't permit things to get through that aren't true. I, I go back to the, <coughs> you know, in David's lineage, it would say this one did the things of the Lord, but the Asher poles up in the highlands were still there. He mm. didn't tear those down. <clears throat> and then was it Joash that tore everything down? He got me. <laughs> and but then somebody else will come in and he didn't do things of the Lord. He followed his fathers that were mm. nasty. And then the next one came in and he was either following that guy or he followed the Lord, but those things up on the high ridges and the back waters and the whatever were still allowed to be there. Mm-hmm. Very few of them came in and tore all of them down. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those filters that we have, we need to make sure all those things are torn down. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I uh, hear when we read about this one is um, what we we just finished not too off long ago, a study on uh, the quote-unquote progressive church, unquote. And <coughs> in a nutshell, they want to um, claim Christianity, but then allow all of the, um, I don't know how to say this um, diplomatically, the end result of their rationalizations that veer away from scripture end at allowing sexual perversion as if it's okay. Um, Allowing not just loving on someone who violates the word of God when it comes to sexuality, but saying it's approved by God. Mm. It's okay. It's not sin. And and many of those even then do away with, you know, at least doctrinally, if not in their practice and thoughts, um, atonement. Yes. That's another one of the um, the stress points is they redefine what sin is and use that to nullify the need for atonement, um, which is the blood of Christ, you know, the death of Christ in your stead. Um says the the, the quote-unquote progressive church does not believe that that is necessary anymore. That God um, taking the life of his only son is just some form of cosmic child abuse. And they use those terminologies. Um, And so it strips the deity of Christ away. Mm -hmm. It strips the um, the truth of the word of God away, and they will rationalize stripping the history of the scriptures away, and um, all while still saying um, we're Christians. But either Jesus is who he says he is, or he is not. There is no compromise. And so if you permit Jezebel to teach, Jezebel's thing was illegitimate authority. She usurped the authority of the king in at that point in history to a very, she did great damage. So, and her husband, the king, didn't really do 
<laughs> he didn't stop, no. you know, the compromise or the, you know, the teachings that she was bringing forth. And what did, what did, what were they heading for? What was Jezebel's end game? Her end game was sexual deviancy. So we have a church of Thyatira now, and it's trying to slip in under the guise of, under the cloak of Christianity, when in truth it is a very um, slithering type of evil. And the hard part of that is, and the reason for it, is because, you know, we want, and this is a right thing, you want more people to come in. But in wanting more people to come in, you say, well, you know, yeah, I'll pay all of that, and that's okay, and this is okay, and this is okay. Once you're in, not even saying, yeah, come in as a sinner. I don't expect anybody to come in as a sinner. But just continue that way and not, not ever present salvation, not ever present growth in the Lord and so forth. That's, you just want folks, well, frankly, for your pocketbook. But that that's basically where that started is, you know, more like a business rather than, than an actual congregation. Mm -hmm. Rather but, uh, than a hospital for yeah. people who need healing. Right. Um, the uh, warning or instruction to that church is give them time to repent. You know, and part of my reasoning for doing that particular study was, um, let's expose it. Give them time to repent because they are in a very dangerous place for themselves. And that's out of love. You don't want people to slide down this particular slippery slope. So give them time to repent. Call them to repentance. And then it says, kill her children with death. Okay? We're not talking physical children, her doctrines, the, the, mm, what she is reproducing with her form of sexual deviancy is doctrinal sin, doctrinal children. Um, so don't go off on the deep end. I know y'all won't, but, you know, anybody that just happens to be watching this, don't go off the deep end and go kill somebody's children because you think they're a bad teacher. Oh. <laughs> Not smart. Um, <clears throat> um, approach the doctrines. Refute them. In the strength of God, in the conviction of God. Yeah. And then hold the line. Defeat the enemy in that area. I have, and I'll hit on this at the end of the study, but um, I've, I've had to learn for myself, you know, what, what in me where I need to basically draw the line. Say, no, you know, you, you can have this much, this much, this much, but not any further than that, you know. And I've experienced enough to where I know where that line is. And sorry, I can't go there. But you have to learn where that line is mm -hmm. because that person that we talked about earlier, that that very close characteristic name, you can forget who you are in him. And that's not good. That's not a good place. The the promise, the happy part. <laughs> no other burden to those who hold to the truth. I mean that alone is just uh, an incredible promise. But the next one is, those that overcome will be given power over the nations. Okay, now this. I'm going to see if I can say it right. In my life right now, I am being held to a very intense standard when it comes to truth and integrity. And I don't know why God is just putting me in that place right now. That's where he's going. We don't get this. Mm -hmm. And my hope 
is that the promise is that if I can learn this lesson, if I can be this person that God is asking me to be, that he will give me influence. And not just over a county or a state, but nations. And it's not because I want the attention, because trust me, he will tell you, I don't like the attention. That's why I'm balking on this book thing. It's very hard for me. It's because it could very possibly point a spotlight at me. And I know who I am. I don't want a spotlight on me. So, but if I can do it, if God can get me in the right place, he can give me influence among the nations. And that influence will be able to stand. It, it will have such an intense foundation that it will be able to stand. And that influence will just, I mean, like, draw people to God. Like, oh, my lands, I want to do, I want to do what that person is talking about. I want to serve a holy and just God who loves me beyond comprehension. That's the sort of influence I want. So that is an incredible promise if you don't compromise the truth. Can I read one more? Just maybe even read it if you guys don't want to go and talk about it. That's okay. But Sardis. But um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to wear you out. Yes. <laughs> but. I, I feel it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm looking at JP and Ivy. Oh uh, yeah, I I know I'm. I'm a little tired. I know she is too, but yeah. we'll, we can. We'll hang <coughs> on Wait, let, let's try again. Let's see if it's a big one. <laughs> if it's if it's a if it's normal. I'm I'm taking you where it ends right there. Okay, I'll be right here. Yeah, we can at least read through it, and if we need to come back and go. pick it up next week, right? Yeah, right. why don't you do that? Yeah. Uh, sorry, where is that? Um, da -da -da -da. there you were. Chapter three. The angel of the Messianic community in Sardis, 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 right. Here is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know what you are doing. You have a reputation for being alive, but in fact, you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains before it dies too. For I have found what you are doing incomplete in the sight of my God. So remember what you received and heard and obey it and turn from your sin. For if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief and you don't know what, uh, pardon me, and you don't know what moment I will come upon you. Nevertheless, you do have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes and they will walk with me clothed in white because they are worthy. <laughs> He who wins the victory will, like them, be dressed in white clothing, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. In fact, I will acknowledge him individually before my Father and before his angels. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the Messianic Yeah, this is a good one to do along with the one right before. <clears throat> yeah. Anyone getting married knows what white clothing is. <laughs> Purity. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't want to be a church that has this sort of a letter written about it, you know? <laughs> I was just thinking, I was like, uh, man. To be striving to look like you're alive, but you're really dead. Is mm -hmm. what I heard out of that. You know, we can so alive. easily fit into that because... We get so busy doing things, mm -hmm. we're not taking time to take in him, mm -hmm. to worship him. Preach my notes. We just, <laughs> we just do and do and do mm -hmm. and do and do. I'll yeah. read my notes and then we'll go. Oh, how's That's that? That's perfect. Because it's a paragraph. <laughs> Sardis is also located in Martin. Turkey was actually the capital of ancient Lydia. If there is anything that I point that I may point out 
that is an overarching matter of ancient Lydia. It is the rise of a strong business sense or business wisdom. And in Ivrit, that's called Sikil. <laughs> that word first appears when Adam and Eve were tempted and Eve said that she could see where eating that fruit would make her mm. quote unquote wise. It's a business sense, business wisdom, common sense, you know, the sort of thing that you survive with. A sevenfold spirit of God or our seven aspects of the spirit are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. You can count the times that the spirit is mentioned there seven times. Something has happened within the Messianic community of ancient Sardis. That is, something has stolen something highly important out of them, causing them to die spiritually and, yes, psychologically. Sekiel and Hokma. Hokma is the heavenly wisdom. It's what James calls the, heaven, the wisdom from above. Sekiel and Hokma should work together. They do in Proverbs anyway, but this can only happen when Hokma is seen clearly to be what one cannot do without. And we'll hit upon that in Proverbs chapter 3. Still, some have soiled their wedding garments. To those who have, who do overcome, Yeshua will give them white, those white garments, as well as a name that is blotted out, not blotted out of the book of life. These white clothes are also noted as the clothing of the high priest when he enters into the Holy of Holies. And I gave a bunch of Scripture references there, but you can check that out too. So the white garments are both wedding clothes as well as what the high priest wears when into the direct presence of the Lord. But that's just simply my note on that. We can read it again next week and talk more about it. Um, 831 there's a podcast I've been listening to called, well, I think we wrote that. What are you thinking of it too? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Mm. It's um, about a church up in Seattle, Seattle yeah, that uh, was kicked off in, in the 90s and things like that. But you hear now there's a lot of abuse and just stuff happening within the leadership at that mm. church. Um, it wasn't sexual in nature, but they just, there was a lot of an intensity driven by kind of that one man leadership. And, um, but a lot of this, like it just, you know, it, it looked alive. People were coming to the Lord, you know, it's like it's that kind of thing. But behind it, there's just a really dead, dead mm -hmm. spiritual mm -hmm. culture. Yeah, it's an interesting story, and we can kind of look back on it now. Like the church has since disbanded, and the pastor has kind of moved on for better or worse. But uh, you know, just looking back on it, you can kind of and and people that were there and part of leadership, you know, took a lot of just overlooked a lot of these kind of you know what would seem to be red flags to us by saying, oh, well, you know, we're reaching. 15,000 people every Sunday and, you know, yeah. baptizing people and, and all good things. And I'm sure mm -hmm. those baptisms are real and God is reaching people. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you have a, a, a leader here that is in some really, you know, not, not healthy good. things, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting, you know. One of the things I was thinking about yesterday um, is that what I'm spraying about. Um, that okay i just know two words for one bit simple pastors okay and this is like simple as in bad okay bad um you know if you would say simpleton. yes <laughs> there's the word simpleton <laughs> pastors okay <laughs> and and this is not in uh i will say well it's not in judgment of them but i was praying oh god we need less of those more people who are really willing to know far more than anybody in their congregation knows about God. You know, I lead to lead in your relationship and your knowledge of God. Okay, so I was praying about that. And the other thing I was praying about is that we would have fewer immature churches. 
that we would have more maturity in the believers and oh my gosh the leadership should be the first you know yeah that's you should be striving for maturity and um leading in that direction and so yeah that's That's what you said that that. i gave you replicate talks about how all these churches that are so into getting people saved, but their back door is just as busy as their front door because they mm-hmm. don't know how to keep the people there mm-hmm. and how to mature them to the point of being disciples so that they can mm-hmm. be discipling someone else. Mm-hmm. And hopefully I've learned that, if not the hard way, because, well, I mean, left on so many left on the a political note, you know, we're way over here, far left, and you don't agree, we don't agree with you or whatever, but still, I hopefully I've learned better how to help folks mature there, yes. but let me read something, speaking <laughs> of, oh, I'm sorry, that cracks me up, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I can see what he's about to read, <laughs> well, um, I understand, I think I've said this before, but, uh, and certainly to JP, but, <laughs> and here I said, you know, we, we just read this at home, but um, I said this to JP a few times, but there are two words for grace in Hebrew, and one is saving grace, chen, mm-hmm. and the other chesed, which is huge, huge word, mammoth word. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it is a powerful word. And another word that I mentioned a bit ago, chokma, is an extraordinarily powerful word. But anyway, um, I'm going to read to you about saving grace mm-hmm. in Proverbs 31 about the woman of valor. Mm-hmm. It says, verse 30, charm can lie, beauty can vanish. The word beauty there is chen, mm-hmm. saving grace. And it, it, it means saving grace and or it can mean beauty. It literally means to pick somebody up out of, just like Hesed means that too, but Hesed is much bigger. Beauty can vanish, beauty can flee. It's fleeting, says King James. But a woman who fears Adonai should be praised. Give her a share in what she produces. Let her works speak her praises at the city gates. Proverbs 31 describes somebody who's crowing. Growing, mm-hmm. not merely being saved. Save salvations, like me asking my wife to marry me. She says yes. Right. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. I'm glad we actually went forward with it. I'm glad that it didn't flee away. I'm glad that we actually entered into marriage and grew together. Yes. That's called chesed. Yeah. <laughs> that is mm-hmm. huge. So, you know, I'm... Growth is important in any any congregation, I feel like. Yes. And and not, you know, Second Peter, add to your faith. And then it mentions stages of growth. And the last thing he says, so therefore grow. And he chapter two is a rant on people who don't grow, basically. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I were to say anything, especially today, to congregations, say, hey, you know, keep growing. Don't don't find that place to stop. Keep yeah. growing. Keep right. maturing. You're never going to be just like our Savior. Yeah. So keep chasing him. Mm-hmm. Okay. There. I'll be quiet now. Okay. Pray. All right. Thank you, Father, for <coughs> tolerant for, <laughs> yeah, tolerant. For, for patience. Well, thank you, Father, for this evening and for, yes, close friends. And I just ask that you would give him good rest tonight. Sometimes we can sleep an hour and it'd be great rest and be or sleep eight hours and be lousy rest. But I just ask that you give them good deep rest tonight so that we can have a good, you know, day of progress tomorrow. And um, and thank you again for good discussion led by your spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.